We, uh, welcome everybody. We're just waiting as a few more uh, participants uh, join in the um, webinar. We've had about 26 people register for today. So uh, that's good. Um, I'll begin the session. Um, Welcome everyone, I'm John Rule. I work as the Senior Research Manager for the National Association of People with HIV Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land from which this webinar is hosted. Um, we also acknowledge National Sorry Day, which has just passed and look forward to NAIDOC celebrations next week. Uh, just a bit of background for those who may not have attended one of the seminars before, We've had uh, sessions that are focused on public health and epidemiology. Uh, last month, we had a webinar on social and survey research. Both those webinars are now available on the NAPA website. Uh, today, we continue in our research capacity building activities by concentrating on the idea of research into practice and practice into research. Uh, just a reminder of the uh, learning objectives. Um, one of them was to um, promote a greater awareness of the role of communities and community organisations in shaping the research agenda, um, drawing on community knowledge and emerging issues and intelligence from the field. Uh, indeed, today we've got two wonderful presenters who have had uh, long involvement in this uh, area of work, um, Dr Dean Murphy and Dr Kirsty Machen who will be, um, the structure of this webinar will be, uh, Kirsty will do her presentation, Dean will do his presentation, and then we have Dr. Jeannie Ellard, who will be coming on to act as a, a discussant and explore the issues a bit further. Um, please use the uh, Q&A um, button to put any questions in, but if you could kind of hold in your mind what questions you might like to ask until uh, towards the end, uh, today is not structured as problem solving. Um, today is an opportunity really to draw upon the knowledge and experience of people like Dean and Kirsty, who have generously contributed their time. So uh, we'll move on to the presentation uh, from Dr. Kirsty Machen. Kirsty has her own bio included and uh, Kirsty's presentation is interestingly titled This Research Thing. Uh, so thank you, Kirsty, for taking us through this research thing. And also, I know you're going to be talking about an area that you're interested in. Indeed, I think we're all interested in uh, research justice. Uh, thanks, Kirsty. Mm -hmm. Mute myself and share my screen. So um, let me just. OK, so those slides are fine, aren't they? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, thank you everybody. Um, uh, I'm Kirsty Machen. Um, I am employed as the Executive Officer at the moment of Positive Women Victoria. I'm sort of here in a um, hybrid uh, capacity in my own right as well as somebody who's been involved in HIV research as an advocate and ally of people living with HIV for many years. Um, I acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and my presentation is going to be discursive um, and I guess uh, intended to sort of provoke discussion and, and uh, stimulate some ideas and thinking rather than sort of um, tell people what's what. But I will give some examples of um, both historical and current kind of issues um, around the, the practice of research, how research is kind of used by people working in and for community organisations and peer-led organisations. And as John said, I want to talk a little bit about um, research equity um, and those communities who aren't being necessarily kind of captured or made visible um, in the research agenda. Um, and also finally, um, briefly look at whether um, there is um, a place uh, for a community-led national research body, which is a topic that comes up from time to time. Um, so, why am I, who am I to talk about this at all? Um, I've been over many years a HIV journalist um, and editor for uh, Positive Living. I'm a policy researcher, uh, I work for Positive Women Victoria. Um, I've also worked on national and international HIV research bodies as representatives of different organisations in immune-based therapies, antiretroviral drugs, therapeutic vaccines, and nation internationally. And um, I've written and presented on the ethical issues in clinical and social research as well as um, uh, being a part of research projects that we've done here at Positive Women Victoria. 
Um, I just wanted to think briefly about the kinds of research that people might engage with, because you might sort of think, oh, well, it's sort of obvious, but I guess it's worth running through the, the gamut. So the kinds of research that um, is relevant and that I would use from time to time is runs from basic lab science, so cells, protein structures, phylogenetics, clinical research, uh, you know, I use science in bodies, really, drugs and vaccines and health interventions, epidemiological research, so tracking the patterns of transmission and identifying changes and vulnerabilities um, uh, in the prevention effort and, and the patterns of HIV, um, and social research, um, of course, which is a vast kind of concept that encompasses all sorts of lived experience issues around trauma, stigma, understanding um, how interventions and health interventions work, social determinants of health, negotiation of sex, and a whole range of things. Um, in terms of what, when I say what is research even for, what is it for? I mean, what kinds of things might we use it for? Well, for example, we can use it for, obviously, there's the individual health and well-being, which would be the obvious things like treatments and, and um, health interventions. But research is always val also valuable to inform policy, to inform practices and social interventions, uh, to support the actions and priorities that we do take and to, to help sort of understand resourcing decisions, which is actually a really important function. Um, evidence for health promotion, um, evidence that health promotion is working, and evidence that it's not working. And I'm going to come back to that question of what doesn't work towards the end. Um, and in general, I think we can say that um, research can help us to know what's happening, what was, what goes right, what goes wrong, what could go wrong in the HIV response. Um, in practice, we might use research here at Positive Women Victoria in a range of different ways. So, for example, in our recent submission to the Aged Care Royal Commission a couple of years ago, um, we drew on futures data, social and housing data, uh, clinical data that looked at um, the impacts of HIV on cognition in older people. Um, we've used it to understand how to connect with clients, um, such as an important project PWV did about the experiences of women from African diaspora communities um, connecting with positive women. Um, arguing for more transparent priority outcomes for women and heterosexual men in the National HIV Strategy, which was um, something that we all signed on to last year. And that drew on epidemiological data as well as data on impacts for specific communities of, of HIV and, and stigma and so on. Um, epidemiological justice for um, women, but also for other other groups, but um, for women in particular, for example, we've done work on early and better access to testing and access to PrEP, all of which sort of draws on a range of research. Um, and submission to sex worker decriminalisation, um, because, you know, it's been well established in research that punitive and criminalising approaches are bad for public health. So why does the community need to get involved in research at all? And when I talk about the community, I'm talking about community organisations, the, the HIV organisations, the LBGTIQ plus organisations, as well as the peer-based and peer-led HIV organisations. So I guess uh, the reasons are that um, there's a potential for all of those communities and, and individuals within them to benefit from the research, um, to know that the research, uh, any research that's being conducted is safe and ethical, because communities do have a stake in what we need to know and to understand um, um, and, and do understand what it takes to deliver better health and wellbeing outcomes. Um, also, um, community participation allows people to have direct insights into the experience of being researched or potentially being researched. Um, and another important reason is that people might be doing peer-led research, such as co-designed research through a positive voice organisation as an example. Um, so how community engagement happens is an interesting question. Could we do better? Probably. Um, historically, there used to be some quite formal and structured partnerships, um, such as designated places for people with HIV and partnership pages on national, on quite an extensive national research um, working group sort of uh, network, um, and as well as participation in ethics committees or research project steering groups. And that was quite formal for some time. It's kind of become less formal um, as the uh, HIV response has changed. But there are some other models for participation, for example, um, the Melbourne Cure Consortium, um, which is funded to um, promote uh, research into HIV. Cure has a community advisory board um, made up of people living with HIV who direct advice back to that consortium. 
Um, there's also action or participatory research um, and co-designed research where potential participants um, establish, help establish the question and are involved right through from the setting through to the conduct of the research and some informal networks um, with research organisations and agencies and, and partner organisations, which is probably principally how it happens now. Um, and we'll come back to whether that really captures um, everybody in the loop that it should. So I'm going to touch on some ethical questions. Um, uh, the first one is, in fact, about questions. And I want to think about the kinds of questions that people might ask in research. And that might range from what does this cell do through to does the experience of racism lead to people not accessing services as example questions. But for people who are thinking about research or want to conduct research or do conduct it who are online, um, before um, people, people start, I think it's really important to say why are we asking any particular question and why, in that case, aren't we asking some other question? Um, there's also the issue of whether questions have been answered already. There is a lot of duplication that happens in research, I think, and part of it's due to how research gets accessed um, and the problems with sort of accessing research and the publication process, which I'll touch on. Um, we also want to think about who really needs to know any given question. Now, ideally, you might think, well, it's, it's about what people with HIV or those affected by the research outcome need to know. But there are other people who have legitimate reasons to know things, um, governments, universities, researchers who might be motivated by their own specific ideas, uh, drug companies certainly do need to know things, um, policy wonks um, who are applying things in practice do need to know things. So everybody wants to know something, but time and money and attention spans and the people who are being uh, the, the subjects or the objects of the research um, it's, are, are a limited resource. Um, we don't think of them as a resource. In terms of planning, uh, research. Um, I just want to give an example of the kinds of things that can possibly go wrong if you don't have um, an effective sort of um, mechanism for engaging communities within research. Um, some of you may be aware of the infamous case of the Cambodian PrEP studies. These were early proposals to identify the effectiveness of PrEP, which proposed trialling it in communities um, in Southeast Asia, where women who were working in the sex industry at that time, around 2004, were at significant um, risk of, of acquiring HIV through, through their employment within the first 12 months of work. Um, and that's a shocking figure. So the question was, could PrEP um, in the form of tenofovir um, um, uh, uh, reduce rates of HIV infection compared to condom use alone? So it seemed like a good question to ask and an important question, but there were some huge um, problems that actually led to these studies becoming very controversial and eventually shut down. One was that there was a lack of comprehensive negotiation with the communities, and that included even knowing who were the appropriate organisations on the ground in Southeast Asia to be consulting with. Um, there was inadequate prevention counselling for the trial participants that was built into the study protocols. There really was an important question that some legitimate historical fears, concerns and sensitivities that people um, in Southeast Asia had about commercially developed medicines developed in, in Western countries being trialled in really vulnerable communities with poor access to healthcare. And that was a very underestimated kind of psychological issue that led to a lot of concerns. So this went wrong. There were concerns with the trial design. There was uncertainty about insurance and indemnity and the protection of participant rights. And the groups representing sex workers felt that many issues weren't addressed, such as access to antiretroviral therapy and healthcare for people who might have contracted HIV during the study period uh, through their, their work. And some ethics committees were concerned that um, these kinds of things could represent an inducement to participate. So there was no agreement on that. And eventually, um, against the background of some very, very bad memories, for example, some really unethical trials of AZT on pregnant women that had happened in the 1990s in Thailand, um, this happened. Protests um, at the World AIDS Conference shut the studies down. So what could have happened better, and this is an example for everyone to sort of draw on, even though the example is specific to these cases, um, the importance of fact-finding missions, so understanding who your communities are that you need to be dealing with, taking time to build confidence in and explain any intervention or question that you're researching to the communities, involving community-led groups on trial advisory boards, engaging local media and community information networks used by sex workers, and do all this before the study um, is, is designed, but mostly what they failed to do was identify and understand what the fears, concerns, and even misconceptions might have been about PrEP before the study was designed. So in other words, there was no, uh, the effort wasn't successful in ensuring that trial protocols met the community expectations in a range of areas around uh, compensation, uh, trial justice, 
um, and standard of care. So another ethical question um, is about that, in, that we want to think about from a research justice point of view. And by research justice, I mean capturing, making sure that we know what we need to know about a range of communities to get better outcomes. It's the questions that don't get asked um, because of um, a range of different reasons I'm going to touch on. So here are some of the ways that questions don't get asked. So people might say, well, we don't have any theory, theoretical data to tell us how to act upon this issue, so therefore we won't act on this issue. And because we don't have any practical data either, let's not do anything. So one example of where this has um, been applied, been applicable, I think, is um, in terms of the complete lack of, of um, action in making PrEP accessible to women, but also a lack of action on getting any data or any understanding of how we might make PrEP accessible to women, um, in what ways, what does that mean in the Australian context? Another question that might come up is, the numbers are too small and anyone working with women uh, with heterosexually identified men with people born um, overseas in some circumstances will be familiar with this question. People will say, oh, well, we can't really understand much about this topic because the numbers are too small, there aren't enough people, we can't do the research and therefore um, there continues to be um, a lack of action on addressing many issues, even though we know that anecdotally and from repeated qualitative research, we do know a lot about how, for example, women or heterosexually identified men uh, affected by HIV. Another problem that where a question might not get asked is someone will say, well, but this is a more pressing concern than that. So we don't talk or act about that issue because we need to focus on this issue. And so the example that I could give there is that research overwhelmingly in Australia has focused on and followed those most affected according to the epidemiology, which makes some sense, and then the dollars follow the numbers. But as the epidemic has changed, um, we need to kind of look at how the research practices should and could be changing to sort of make sure that it's actually capturing research questions for those people for whom justice is not being delivered through the research process. And finally, there's the kind of we don't know anything, um, uh, you know, the, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good problem, which is the problem where which might be framed something like, well, research into this topic doesn't tell us absolutely everything we need to know, and it would be difficult to definitively answer this, say, with a randomised study. So no further research is done. And that means that the topics are just very difficult for researchers to engage with for different reasons. And for that difficulty reason, they don't engage with them. And then people will say, but we don't have any information. So U equals U for injecting drug use and a range of things that have happened around women and breastfeeding um, fall into that category. As with women and breastfeeding, I believe that it has taken a very long time for us to shift the ground away from the advice that women with, with um, who have an undetectable viral load should formula feed and can't breastfeed for a bunch of reasons. Um, the numbers have always been it's said too small, so the, therefore the question hasn't been asked. Um, a lot of the research is from overseas and people have worried that we'll just keep assuming that there the health systems and social contexts are very different. So we'll just keep saying that there's not enough Australian data and so we'll keep saying that Australian women should formula feed their infants. Um, there's the issue that you can't ethically do a randomised control trial or intervention with, with children and, and mothers under that circumstance. So then the assumption is, well, we just don't think there's any way of um, obtaining meaningful information. So people don't investigate alternative sort of research strategies for kind of getting um, at that question. And they just keep saying, coming back to women should formula feed their infants. There's finally um, what I would say the zero risk and the long arm of the law problem, which are kind of related, which is that some people will say, well, there's no research that confirms that it's absolutely 100% zero in, um, uh, and impossible for transmission uh, to infants to occur through breastfeeding. So we shouldn't discuss the matter at all. And it could be a medical legal problem for me. And I'm going to call social services. Of course, we now know that, um, that the ground has shifted on that, but it's taken um, a long time. And part of that was this constant sort of um, recursion to these, these responses in the research. Um, so another ethical question is around community being over-research and over-research. And people with HIV are a very over-researched community in Australia in some ways, especially individuals. And maybe it is okay for people to say no to participating in unimportant research questions and people should consider if their research question is important, um, including the endless surveys that people are sort of asked to sometimes engage with that, for things that might even have common sense answers. So time isn't a limitless resource and neither are people. Um, for researchers, I guess one thing to think about in relation to the over-researched issue is do we already know this? Has the question been asked before and what will my 
collect my research into this add to the collective knowledge. And, um, you know, another peer re review journal for me or, or my institution probably isn't the best um, answer there. Um, for policymakers and service providers, I think we all need to be asking, can we infer our knowledge from pre-existing data, from experience, from other sources? And is doing yet another research project really kind of needed? Do I need this data enough to justify collecting it and, and going through the study? So I think we can all be asking those questions because I think everybody assumes we need to do research when maybe what we need to do is use the existing research better, draw on other kinds of methodologies for acquiring knowledge. Um, ethics four, so a little bit on impacts, harms and consent. So obviously recruitment procedures for any study need to be ethical and the consent truly informed. But conversely, informed consent shouldn't be a barrier. And Missing Voices, which was a project on women and their attitudes and experiences to clinical research and cure research that we did with La Trobe University and positive women, showed that clinician assumptions do infect, affect whether women are informed about research opportunities that they might be interested in, including for women whose first language is not English, where they will, where the clinicians confess that they will often say, I'm not going to offer this to that woman because mm -hmm. their language is not English and it may be too hard to get the informed consent. So research justice sort of requires us to think a bit more about how you, you open up um, those opportunities. Um, the, the harms and consent question also means minimising and, and or mitigating um, any impacts like time sites, visit sites, privacy or confidentiality risks, and thinking very carefully about requiring people to depart from established standards of care. And that actually comes up in cure studies where um, people are often asked to undertake analytic treatment interruptions. Um, Finally, there, for social research, I think there are some really important um, ethical questions around not re-traumatising people, not asking people or the same small number of people to constantly share sometimes the same intimate, personal or, or sort of um, detailed aspects of their lives with perhaps multiple research teams. Um, Finding, uh, sharing findings is an important question and um, one of the reasons why research tends to get repeated sometimes. So I think, first of all, um, we just need to touch on the question about what happens if your research doesn't confirm or support your established or your cherished idea, or if your intervention isn't a success, or if your drug doesn't work, or if your, your, your social intervention doesn't work. We hear a lot about what works, but maybe people also need to um, be open and and treat what doesn't work as a learning opportunity. Um, unfortunately, people tend not to send out press releases when something doesn't work. Um, another point um, in uh, the publication and dissemination issue is the lack of accessibility to knowledge about research findings, which can diminish its use value and application. And people out there who are working for community organisations probably have had this experience of wanting to look at a research thing coming up against an academic paywall. You can buy this article for $5,000 from Elsevier or whatever um, large conglomerate is, is protecting the, um, the publication. Um, I would encourage people to think about open source publication for important research questions, especially um, if they've been funded on public money. That's an ethical kind of position that I feel strongly about. Um, but research hiding behind academic paywalls doesn't seem to get doesn't get necessarily seen in use, and it may even lead to organisations not knowing that things are there and repeating research already done. Um, are there other ways for information to be shared between organisations that can't afford subscription to academic platforms? Um, yes, I think so. Um, and that might be something to discuss in um, in our discussion session later. Uh, so another dissemination question is how things get out that are important to be known. So, I mean, my question here is what if there was a cure but no one knew? I assume if somebody cured HIV, we would find out. But you can't assume that big news gets on the front pages. And the studies that confirmed that an undetectable viral load means you can't transmit HIV were massive. Um, they were massive for stigma. They were massive for, for social and individual practice. But it never was front page news. And convincing people of it years after those studies came out is still an ongoing problem. So whose responsibility is it to communicate important findings with affected communities and where relevant the wider community of that, so that that practice can, can change? And whose responsibility is it to share outcomes with the research participants? And we um, have thought about that quite a lot at Positive Women Victoria about the women that have contributed to our research projects and how would they like to be informed of these outcomes? Um, Compensation, so how is participation valued? Um, perhaps that's monetary, but that raises the question of comp compensation versus um, what might be an incentive or inducement to 
be part of a study you would otherwise not agree to. So are there other ways of valuing research participation beyond money? And I think we can talk a little bit about that um, as a community as well. Um, finally, uh, I just wanted to touch on the question that arises from time to time is, is there now a place for a community-led research body such as a, um, a community ethics um, or community advisory board? Um, my answer is probably, and that's just me talking, but then you've got to value it and support it, and you have to value and support it likely with some funding. You've also got to give it a meaningful role because community research bodies shouldn't be there to make basic scientists or clinicians or research scientists of the members, and it isn't something only for somebody with a science degree. So you've got to build the skills and not assume the skills, and the skills are about in communicating lived experience, not trying to second-guess the science. And you've also got to listen to what is said by those bodies. So if a community advisory board or a body says that your research idea just isn't a priority, isn't interesting, um, isn't any good, um, what authority does that body have to sort of say, well, we don't really recommend that people sort of take part in this project. So it's got to be independent. And finally, um, I just want to talk about the makeup of such a group because diversity to me is a merely descriptive term, but um, the equitable and meaningful participation of people with a range of perspectives and experiences is actually an outcome. And for um, a body like that to work, I think you need the outcome, not, not the not the descript the descriptive term. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And um, I gather that questions um, can come towards the end after Dean's spoken. Thank you. Yeah, look, that's um, great. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, you know, you've outlined the history, uh, you know, present dilemmas, models of participation, uh, talked about questions that don't get asked, uh, you know, explored that concept of research justice, those excellent um, examples from Cambodia on PrEP and women and breastfeeding, and also ideas about using existing research. And also you've kind of raised a question there at the end, which uh, is an ongoing discussion we need to have. So thanks, Kirsty. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dean Murphy, and Dean has his own biography prepared. So um, thanks, Dean, for um, coming along today, and we appreciate your knowledge base and the time you're contributing here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, I'm going to provide you with some of the constraints and opportunities, I think, um, uh, based on the way HIV research and research in general is currently organised, as well as my own uh, observations and experience. Uh, and I'm uh, the way Kirsty and I have designed it is that some of the stuff we're doing will complement each other, and, and there'll be some points um, of uh, possibly contention that we can pick up in the discussion. So who am I? Just to give you um, a sense of, of my the perspective I'm talking from, I did work um, for quite a long time in, in a range of different community organisation roles um, um, at a FAO. And I also was a community liaison officer for a couple of years um, at the, as it was known then, National Centre on HIV Social Research. And that involved working closely oh, in a specific role that was designed to liaise between researchers and um, community organisations in the HIV sector. Um, I then did a PhD at, at UNSW. And since then, I've been working in a number of uh, research centres, and um, most of which you will know of, so the Centre for Social Research and Health, National Drug Research Institute, um, Kirby Institute and Archers currently, where I've just um, started, and also uh, at the Gender and Cultural Studies Department at the University of Sydney. So um, I'm just going to follow some of the um, questions that were posed to us in terms of um, the uh, learning outcomes for this uh, webinar. So first to reflect on the value of using research, and I'm gonna divide it up into um, value to health promotion service uh, delivery and policy um, makers, and then also value to researchers. So first um, to um, the former, um, using research provides um, a way in which interventions can align with uh, identified needs. So it can address knowledge gaps and um, things like attitude changes. 
uh, research can also provide uh, a basis for evaluation. So um, it can uh, prove change and effectiveness of programs. It also promotes innovation. For example, changes to approaches, theories, and even identities. And I'd also add that it actually promotes some reflexivity. For example, um, things like policy research or discourse analyses um, can, can um, reflect on um, the kind of the way that um, interventions are designed. Uh, research, using research can also provide evidence of an issue, problem or object to practice that is known or intuitive within the field. And uh, I think Kirsty's touched on this a little bit. For example, uh, um, can provide evidence um, of a practice, for example, or a risk reduction strategy that was well known um, or used quite commonly. For example, the use of undetectable viral load as a risk reduction strategy is a good example. But what about uh, value to researchers? And we don't often think about this, and I think it's probably uh, really useful for people on the seminar to know um, what um, value we get out of um, our research being used. Firstly, it provides evidence of what's called impact. And this is, um, um, so especially if uh, research is cited in documentation, for example, in um, background materials, campaign briefs that are used to develop interventions. And um, it's quite important if the research gets cited because it can be used um, in terms of our uh, performance assessments and even selection criteria for jobs, as well as in grant applications and reporting. And um, at, at a kind of slightly different level, um, some grant schemes have the um, requirement for a national interest test. So you've got to prove that your, um, uh, your research or your intended research is going to make a difference. Um, using research, so the community using research also um, uh, allows researchers to know how their findings of their studies are being interpreted and used. And that you know, can sometimes be a surprise or can stimulate further um, analyses or research. And finally, it just provides encouragement to keep going. So I'm um, <clears throat> sure it's no surprise. Um, knowing that your research is used and is considered valuable is, is obviously important. So turning now to the community's role in shaping research, um, the first um, uh, point I wanted to um, mention was uh, the community can identify gaps in knowledge and I think it's important if, if the gaps are uh, identified that they be documented so written down kind of formally and then formally raised and then repeated um, and that's a way something can get on a uh, research agenda. Similarly lobbying for inclusion of issues of concern so it might be a, a particular gap in knowledge but it might be something that is intuited uh, needs more attention. Uh, as Kirsty's already mentioned, an important role is identifying potential overlaps and repetition and when that might be a problem. Um, just to also note that it, you know, it is possible to approach individual researchers um, who are usually receptive um, to new ideas. And the community can also promote change in the framing of research questions and analyses. And this is really important because um, can uh, influence the way that things are researched. And the example I've given there is, uh, for example, framing research questions from a strength-based approach rather than a uh, traditional deficit-based approach. And similarly, framing um, and the language and terminology used in uh, even research questions, but also in materials related to research and uh, recruitment. As Kirsty's already mentioned um, as well, the um, uh, participation in study oversight groups, um, for example, advisory committees and community advisory boards is, um, a role, is a role that the community can have in shaping research uh, and providing advice and sampling and recruitment. Um, also, particularly there's some uh, grant schemes that are particularly uh, amenable, in fact, require um, part community or industry partners. 
And the two uh, most common ones are called the um, Australian Research Centre Linkage and the National Health and Medical Research Council uh, Partnership Grant Schemes. And then, of course, um, the ultimate um, power is um, participating in research projects or, of course, refusing to participate. So just to also touch on other factors that influence um, the HIV research agenda, as you probably um, would imagine, the national and state HIV strategies uh, are crucial in shaping the research questions that get asked and therefore also the kinds of knowledge uh, that's produced. And uh, in, at the current moment, there's a strong emphasis on our research that supports particular targets relating to um, the HIV care cascade. In Australia, um, which is linked to the national strategy, we have Commonwealth funded research. Um, and many of you be familiar with uh, studies like the HIV Futures Study, uh, which um, comes under that, uh, and things like the HIV stigma indicators. At a state level, there are also, uh, there's also funding which is linked to state strategies. And um, a, a long running example of that is the gay community periodic surveys, which run in uh, most jurisdictions. There's also investigator driven research. So that uh, includes competitive grants, but also uh, postdoctoral fellowships and uh, PhD and master's projects. So they're opportunities for um, um, kind of new uh, research to be undertaken that doesn't kind of specifically fall under things that are determined by the um, strategies. And another uh, kind of influence or source of funding is um, industry. And um, in the HIV field, um, the, the best and most common example is in our pharmaceutical industry funding. So uh, Kirsty again has touched on this a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, what are the barriers to using and engaging with research and first to focus on using research. So a barrier is where research is published. And as Kirsty mentioned, peer reviewed journals and, and I'd include books and books chapters are often not open access um, and we can talk more about that in discussion um, because uh, there's lots of interesting things to say about that um, but I would note that pre-publication versions are often available and we are encouraged to make them available and um, they, they're available through particular places like researchgate or academia.com or even um, uh, researchers own um, institutional profile pages. Another barrier is how to find what you're looking for and even to know if it exists at all, because of course you don't know until you, until you look. So um, that requires searching. And it, again, um, all these uh, databases or institutional repositories might not be available to everyone, but there's also particular skills involved in, in searching um, that people might not necessarily have if they don't work in um, the research institutions. Then there's the issue of when research findings become available and there's often quite a long time lag between uh, when something is submitted for publication or you know, the end of a research project and, and when something comes out. And to use an extreme example, I've just had an experience of um, an article being sit, sitting at a journal for more than a year before uh, even hearing a word back about it. And in terms of barriers to engaging with research, um, there's issues such as the time and recognition of role by um, organisations. So that's for people who are um, particularly sitting on um, reference groups and so on. Uh, having a knowledge of the discipline in which the studies are being conducted, it might, you know, whether it's um, those um, particular disciplines or others, I'm just kind of focusing on. Um, the kinds of studies I might be involved in and um, kind of the burden of representing a collective voice um, as an individual and the, the consultation that's required to do that. Um, so I just want to finish up with, um, kind of, I guess it's to provide some 
Um, a nice example of uh, research collaboration, we uh, conducted um, some um, well, in 2011, we had we identified this issue of um, HIV negative men rejecting positive men as sexual partners. Okay, not an issue that you um, that many people will be familiar with. Um, uh, and we wanted to do. Uh, I was at FA at the time. We wanted to do uh, a campaign on this, but we we discovered there was a research gap. So we hadn't. Um, collected any data on this issue for a whole decade, kind of surprisingly. And the most recent um, findings we had were from uh, um, a, a study over a decade earlier. So we um, undertook a collaboration between AFAO and the Centre for Social Research and Health and uh, produced the HB Stigma Barometer Survey. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip over the kind of things, but we, we did find there was a, um, a really strong um, and um, tendency to exclusion of, of positive uh, men as sexual partners by HIV negative men. And uh, the data were very similar to um, the findings from more than uh, 10 years before. Um, and, and as a result, we kind of produced this campaign, which is called Fear Less, Live More. Um, so thank you. That was the end of my um, my contribution. And um, yeah. thank 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 you, Dean. Um, it's a um, great contribution uh, that you've made. Um, it's um, obviously sparked some thoughts. Uh, Ronald's put a comment there in the chat. Um, yeah, Dean, it was great thinking about the tips for um, community and shaping research. Um, uh, I, the kind of tension between a kind of organic informal relationships that might get work done and also then the uh, question Kirsty kind of came up with thinking about formal structures um, and a lovely kind of thing towards the end there on a successful collaboration um, where uh, community recognised that uh, some research hadn't been gone on for many years and also researchers realised that at the same time. Thanks, Dean, um, for that. Um, we might, I'd like to invite uh, Jeannie Ellard to uh, join in the um, panel here. Jeannie has been a consultant on this um, initiative of running the capacity building workshops and research webinars. And uh, Jeannie's going to act as a bit of a discussant here with uh, uh, Kirsty, Dean, uh, and, and, and myself. And, uh, uh, if there are any particular questions people want to uh, get into this, please put it in the Q&A and myself or Jeannie will try to bring it into the uh, discussion a bit. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the comment by Ronald that um, community can be influenced, the influencing factors um, is a good kind of point to note. Jeannie, I'll let you continue with your role. Thank you. Thanks, John, and thanks, Kirsty. And, uh, Dean, I I'll pose this question to you, Dean, but it really, it's part of answering a question, my, um, I guess a broader sort of research justice question. So, uh, Kirsty, you can come in on this, but kind of talked about those barriers to using research. But I also think along with those barriers to using research, there's also often a kind of tension around um, how we value the contributions of um community organisations, particularly when research, uh, you know, as research much more in a much more stated way, I think now is in part, you know, is named as in partnership with um, communities. And Dean, I wanted to ask you, because I think you've thought a bit about, you know, because the obvious one that often is, you know, and certainly I think almost always um, now, but not, not always, um, we we might pay research participants. We might even pay um, community organisations. But that's a pretty transactional notion of what valuing is. And so I wanted to ask you first, Dean, to talk a bit about some of the ideas that you have had or thought about about how how you actually might compensate and and show show that valuing in in different ways. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
and I guess I would uh, like to differentiate between participating in a project and being a representative um, on one of the many types of advisory kind of structures or bodies that we kind of have listed in various ways. And so just to start off with them um, or, or, or that kind of example, I've been thinking about it myself because, um, yeah, pain is very transactional. Also, off, more often than not, people who fulfill those roles are already in paid employment. So it's kind of complicated to pay. Also, the way that universities um, finance systems, they don't really, um, <clears throat> are not really very enthusiastic around those kind of one-off payments. Um, uh, so yeah, I've been thinking about the ways that can be valued differently or in, in ways that um, make sense or kind of are meaningful to the people who are doing those roles. And one example I've come up with and my initial research into it suggests would be possible is to maybe provide people who undertake those roles with things like institutional access to our library, library, you know, electronic databases and so on. Um, and that that seems that it would be possible. So for people would be effectively given role as kind of visiting academics or something to institutions and they would get those kind of access. And it might um, kind of moving further along could provide other types of access to things that institutions have access to that maybe community organizations don't. So that's that's the best example I've been able to think of my, myself because that would overcome some of the other problems that we've, Kirsty and I have both raised. Um, um, I might, or we, we might talk about individual um, participation, uh, compensation as well, but I should maybe let someone else chip in there. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was thinking. I was thinking about um, actually huge numbers of studies I now work on. We absolutely pay um, participants for their participation, which really wasn't the case when I came into yeah, the sector. Okay. But actually, there's a bit of a kind of tricky one there because I also know that of the studies I've worked on, the people who least wish to be financially, and I mean often can even take offence at the offer, are often people from um, uh, gay community and from positive communities because, you know, I, there's also other reasons why people participate um, in research. So, um, and again, I think for those reasons, it's, it, it's important when you're running a research project to think about other ways you can compensate people who actually don't want you to turn it into a transaction, but they might, you know, I'm thinking of, of cases like being really open to the, the those participants coming back to you with, you know, like I, I recently had an interaction that was just really about, you know, someone being a bit interested in where they could find a different doctor mm -hmm. or actually quite interested in where they could find out some research about injectable treatment. And mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's getting you know because I don't, I don't know that I always realized that there were things I could offer other than you know we've talked it it, mm -hmm. it I felt privileged those things that there are actually mm -hmm. practical things so I don't know if either yeah. of you want to comment on that yeah. I, what I would say is that there's another way of valuing research that we don't think about and that's making sure that you share the results properly with the communities that are going to benefit from them. I mean, people who are involved in a research study might think that the biggest value for them is that they've contributed to the answer of a meaningful yeah. question that then is going to be picked up in practice. But if people aren't accessing the research, it hasn't been well promoted and the outcomes haven't been given back to people in a way where you can understand what the value is for practice, well, then you haven't really, um, you know, that's not a follow through that sort of, um, that, um, you know, is is respectful, I guess. And that we know that that happens sometimes. And I think, um, yes, there's time and there's all those issues, but I think a respectful kind of follow through is to say, well, one way of valuing research is to let people know 
more broadly what it's found that is kind of useful and valuable. And Dean and I also had a bit of a discussion the other day about, you know, the idea of, you know, can there be some sort of in-kind sort of ways of valuing organisational participation? So, for example, around, um, you know, uh, facilitating some sort of access to, um, you know, uh, research that would otherwise be inaccessible either financially because it's behind a paywall or because it's part of an academic network that you can't afford to subscribe to as an institution. So there might be ways of, of um, valuing research research that are that are different but I think understanding why people participate in research is that it's often altruistic and people aren't looking for a self-gain they're looking for to contribute to a body of knowledge that can be taken up in practice and make people's lives better and showing if that happens and that, that can happen is is a really important value yeah, yeah. Uh, just want to add we try and um um started doing this a few years ago um in terms of writing ethics applications to remind ethics um committees that people do um, often really value the, the contribution they make to research. But yet when we have to fill out um, ethics applications, it's all about the risks of, you know, of their participation. And so, uh, yeah, we, we kind of yeah. do um, that more. Dean, just following up on, and Kirsty again, coming in here, maybe I'm taking a bit of a strengths-based approach here, but Dean, I know you were in a role as a, community kind of uh, research link person for a number of years. What do you think, or for both of you, what, what are some of the good models, you know, because good models of dissemination that that actually does mean that people get, get, get results and findings, but get them in a form that's, you know, because I, I know obviously, and, and I know people appreciate it when you send out a report to them, but that's not the only kind of, you know, yeah. way to do it. I just wondered what you, your reflections yeah. are on that. Well, I think um, kind of I'll just give three examples. One is um, kind of formal research um, feedback sessions, which we used to do kind of travel around the country face to face for various studies and try and bring in relevant related studies. I mean, that was pre Zoom. So, of course, we could do that more efficiently now by more of these kind of things that are related to particular projects and, and that does happen more so. Um, also, um, you know, in, in kind of roles like that, we used to do uh, things like publications that were kind of summaries of, of particular either individual research projects or kind of issues and then we'd maybe focus on one particular relevant local study that we were maybe funded to kind of um, provide a report back on, but also bring in relevant uh, literature in a kind of summary and we called them things like social research briefs we used to do, um, which I think were good. And we often had people from the community providing an overview essay um, that kind of located the issue in the, in the context of, of, of the field. Um, yeah. yeah, so that they're just yeah. examples. Yeah, it's good. If I could say something, Jeannie, there. Yeah, the, those ideas you've talked about, Dean, are things that, uh, yeah, we've been thinking about trying to re energize. I, I guess, in a way, uh, it would be important um, background or historical information for us to also say that those kind of activities were once particularly funded through Commonwealth research grants that went to the universities uh, they're now not so funded yeah. in that way yeah. and I think that's what's uh, yeah. led us to be uh, exploring how to do this differently and yeah. just a comment that's come through in the q and I don't know whether everyone can see that but um, uh, you know again for the it's kind of asking for the research institutions to keep an accessible repository of great literature again uh, that's kind of based on the idea that the research institutions have the funding and the resources to, to do that, yeah. John, does it just maybe define grey literature for people who don't understand the mm. Oh, yes, grey literature, Kirsty would be that which is not published through peer-reviewed journals. So it might yeah. include many of the reports that you've written, um, Jeannie and I have written reports on... Uh, you know, uh, access to services and um, the role of uh, HIV positive people in prevention education. But they are reports that sit with your organisation as well, Kirsty, um, Positive Women Victoria, yeah. that could, uh, yeah, 
if, if and the reason that I ask that yeah. is because I think you know there is this emphasis on the idea that um, when people do research, the gold standard is getting it published in in in, in peer reviewed journals, and that's mm -hmm. you know if you come from a research institution, that's kind of often what is being pushed for, mm -hmm. but that is only part of the picture, and in fact. A lot of the time that doesn't really have, it might have certain kind of um, impacts, but it doesn't have impact in terms of people kind of using the research. Whereas I think we have a lot of kind of knowledge that that has been gained through research things that can be disseminated that hasn't been published in peer reviewed journals. And I think, um, you know, um, putting that out there in ways that can sort of show what what have been learned from those things um, and then with kind of ideas about what you can sort of take from it in practice or even do with it in practice is something that organisations can do to support each other. Um, like drawing, I mean, that's part of what I was saying about drawing on the bodies of knowledge that are, um, that are out there. I mean, in many ways, when you write for publication, you're kind of writing in a form that doesn't always kind of allow you to be more speculative or kind of just talk in very general kind of accessible terms about the practical value and what you might do in practice from that research learning. Yeah, and that grey literature could all, would also include uh, many of the submissions that the organisations are making based, as you pointed out earlier, Kirsty, on information from, for example, the future study. Uh, so uh, yeah. that could also uh, usefully sit. Yeah. I, was just, I, was, I was just going to say that, uh, Kirsty, I completely agree, but and, and I realised when I came into the sector, I, and where I worked, the emphasis was absolutely on the reports and and but the changing, I think there, and I, I don't quite know what we do about this, but the changing demands of a university career are now really push people to you are not rewarded for writing. Yeah. A community um, report. You might even be sort of penalised for, for doing so. And, and plus there's now this whole... Uh, and I'm just reminded of you because you were talking about open access publishing, which I completely agree uh, we should when we and indeed many of the funding schemes um, expect that you will do at least um, some um, open to. access. But it's also part of um, a bit of a frightening capitalist industry in in, yeah. in a way. And the, um, they basically charge, <laughs> charge researchers to publish while not paying them to peer review the yeah so I think there's a lot of big picture stuff that I think we it's good to start having you know because they, they may be where our advocacy efforts also. that's right I mean we can all be sort of advocates for um you know um better acts I mean there's a lot there's a big movement actually in um international research in general uh, with a lot of people and not just you know, way outside of HIV in all disciplines everywhere there is a, a large number of people who are just um really um, appalled by the sort of lack of sort of justice that sort of applies when you restrict research, especially publicly funded research mm. from, from the domain of kind of, um, you know, practice. Um, mm. And um, it is it is an ongoing problem. So in a way, people can all be sort of advocates for that by just bearing in mind that it is a problem and you may have options to publish or disseminate your knowledge in other ways. Yeah, yeah. So just, great. Yeah, Kirstie, um, it's, uh, it's nearly um, four o'clock, so I kind of uh, am tempted to actually wind up in the time that we uh, said we would do. Um, sorry to cut you off there, Jean and, and Jeannie and Dean, but uh, maybe that note that Kirsty uh, finished on, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, you know it's being thought through in lots of other places as well, um, and I think we've contributed to that thinking today. Um, look, I will wind up because it's it's four o'clock. And um, uh, I'll wind up by thanking you again, uh, Kirsty and Dean and uh, Jeannie for being uh, 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 the discussant here today and, and backing up the sessions that have gone on over the last three months. Um, there's an evaluation form that will be sent out to everyone who's on the webinar. Um, I just want to kind of note that we have got people from nearly each state and territory and uh, guests from um, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea, so that's nice. Um, the, uh, this is the last in this series of uh, webinars where we've dealt with uh, epidemiology, public health, uh, social research, survey research, um, and today we um, explored the research into practice question. Um, it, that's been bookended by two other activities of NAPWA. One is the uh, Treatment Officers Network, which um, had uh, um, presentations which are now on our website about 
um, two drug regimens and HIV cure research. And at the next TON meeting, there'll be a presentation, uh, which is kind of from the basic uh, science area on um, the uh, development of injectables and the basic science behind that. So what we'll end up with, what we have ended up with now is a kind of suite of presentations um, from experts in the field on, on these issues. And we will um, be packaging them up at NAPWA and it will be available for everyone. Um, I'd like to just remind you to fill out that evaluation survey when you get it, it'll be sent straight after the session. Um, and uh, thank the panellists again for their presence and participation and thank everyone who's attended today for their presence and participation and um, hope everyone has a good evening. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Bye. Thanks.